right, guys. Welcome back to Strong Successful Mail. So for today, I'm going to be going over part seven of the crazy, crazy story about the three husbands that joined forces to divorce their wives, etc., etc. And guys, this story is definitely one of the craziest ones I've ever gone over here. And I will say this, that it is also one of the most entertaining ones I've ever gone over here. Now, as many of you guys have commented, I thought that this maybe was a BS story, creative reading, creative writing, who knows what. There may be definite truth to that. You know, I don't want to call anybody a liar who writes in their stories to me, but sometimes things are going to be a bit much. But regardless, I hope I'm wrong. Then again, maybe I hope I'm not wrong because I don't want awful things to happen to people. But regardless, I'm going to continue on reading this story because I've, it's that effed up, it's that entertaining, and so many of you guys have been invested in this story, you just can't wait to hear more how this thing plays out. So that's what I'm going to do and uh, continue on. And let me tell you, it's going to be very interesting as I go over this whole thing here about the guys, things that are going on with the courts, with their kids, and there'll be a new gal entering the story that joined in on the girls' nights on occasion that was uh, cheating on her husband. So as these stories continue on, they just get crazier and crazier. So uh, buckle up because this is yet another wild one. He says, uh, hello again, SSM. Uh, once again, the three of us, Steve, James, and me, Brad, want to thank you for running our story and, and your commentary. Also, we want to thank you and those who commented. The advice and support from you and the, and the comments keep us going. Again, our help, heartfelt thanks. Well, you're welcome. You can always count on comments on this channel. Now, this is a further update about our wives, Jesse, Liv, and Fran. The three of us are, are divorcing. We are divorcing all three of them. We discovered that they've been serial cheaters for years, and there's more news. Jesse revealed a fourth wife who joined our wives clubs for the, our wives for girls' night. So we got another one. Shocker. I'm surprised to let another gal be in their competition. There's also an update about the detective who Fran has been involved with. And the latest on Fran's parents separated because I told Fran's father that Fran's mother was still cheating on him and has been for years. Yeah, he wasn't taking that too well. Before we get to the update, I had a couple. Uh, you had a couple questions about how the wives were able to get away with what they were doing in the clubs and the bars, the exhibitionism, and the fooling around with guys in booths, etc. Steve asked Jesse about that, and Jesse said that Fran and Liv, and occasionally Jesse, would scout bars and clubs during the day or in the evening, look for places they had well, they had wanted. They looked for bars or clubs where the bar area was fairly well lit, so they could see the guys who approached them. These are all, aren't these all women that don't have jobs so they can spend their time researching this crap? How about they should be doing more things for their families and kids instead of this? These gals are scumbags. But more important, the place needed to have booths in a dark area so it'd be hard to see what the wives were doing with the guys in the booth. It was easy to find such places. Why we, why we weren't, why weren't they kicked out of the, for the exhibitionism or the nudity? The night Mr. BJ took pictures of, of Jesse in the men's room, they were thrown out. Most, but most bars and clubs were not going to stop them. Guys in the bar would stay to watch the three of the wives parade around. As long as the guys watching them, they were spending money, and management was happy with the free entertainment and the wives provided. Well, that's why all these different bars and clubs will, you know, let, have let, let gals in for free, or, or they're very selective of who gets in the club or, or the bar sometimes, the prettiest gals, because when they let the gals in for free, they know the guys will follow and spend a lot of money. That's, that's how it works. If the girls were stopped, told to cover up, or told to leave, the show was over and guys would move on instead of staying and buying drinks. Exactly. So the girls were more than welcome to do what they wanted in almost all the places they went to. Uh, what about the bumping into people that the wives know? We live in one of the suburbs of, a, uh, suburbs of a large city. That city is surrounded by lots of smaller suburban towns. The wives never went to the bars in the town that we all lived. They went to the towns that they were less likely to come across someone that they knew. If they were discovered at the bar talking with someone, it was just a girl's night and they were just talking. Uh, if they were seen in the booth making out with some guy, they'd be harder to see and would probably spot any person they knew before that person noticed them. The chance of being discovered, of course, added to the thrill. Well, of course, the thrill of getting caught. Now, one question I have is, if they were obviously all drinking all the time, then people are going to be less careful with what they do. But, yeah, they had this down to a science. Once they started going to hotel bars, it was less risky. Most of the hotels they went to were the better ones downtown. Hotel, well, that's where the, that's where call girls go to, because that's what these girls really are. 
Uh, hotel bars were a first step to hotel rooms. If they bumped into someone they knew at a hotel bar, what was that person doing there? Why was he or she in a hotel bar? Any, any, anyone they knew who showed up in a lo local hotel bar would also be there to hook up. The wives spent a lot of time planning their girls' nights. They did not want to be caught, so they did their homework. They were never caught. They did some of the wild things, but rarely had problems with the management. They could have continued what they were doing forever, but Fran asked me for an open marriage. That ended three marriages, now four marriages. Yeah, she hadn't brought that up. This could have gone on way longer. But eventually something would give. Uh, so, what is up with our wives? Liv, James's wife, is living with my wife, Fran, in an apartment they just moved into. Uh, neither sees their kids regularly. Neither has the ability to care for the kids full-time. Neither really wants custody. Well, their actions have shown count countless times they're not exactly mothers of the year. Uh, Jesse continues to live with Hector next door to Steve. They continue to plot to get Steve to reconcile with Jesse. Steve still has a picture over his toilet of Jesse in the men's room giving BJ's. He's not taking Jesse back, but Steve li still listens to Jesse when she calls. Jesse is still providing information about the other wives. It is amazing how she's more than happy to throw those HOE bags under the bus, but, you know, self-preservation always takes, uh, takes place. James has James had his custody during custody hearing on December 27th. He got full custody of both his kids, but it was a very cont contentious hearing. The judge really went after James's wife, Liv. My custody hearing will be later in January. Even though uh, my attorney says not to worry, I do worry. Well, you should worry. Don't count your chickens until they hatch. But my wife, Fran, seems more interested in child support than in caring for our children. Good for me, good for my two sons. Yeah, all these gals are pieces of garbage. But we, have, we can go back and forth on who's the biggest piece of garbage here. Uh, Liv's attorney called our attorney with the proposal that Liv won't fight him about custody if James gives her money. In other words, Liv is willing to sell the kids she doesn't really want to James for a monthly fee. James threw Liv out of their home in the middle of November. She left to live with a local man and she's been seeing over a year. He wanted the SCX but not Liv as a, a live-in lover. When Liv showed up at his place with the news that she was going to stay there, he told her to get lost. Yeah, that's how Chad and Tyrone roll. Uh, Liv then tried to be a long-term lover, tried a long-term lover who traveled to our city on business, and whom Liv would meet overnight. After the local lover rejected her, Liv went to live with this guy in the Midwest. That lasted a little over three weeks. He wanted a housekeeper and a cook, and to continue to see other women. Jesse told Steve that Liv liked the romance and the excitement of seeing this guy when he traveled to our city, but living with him was a disaster. Well, no kidding. She returned home to live with her parents, and during all this time, James and his children didn't hear from her at all. Because she doesn't care. You know, Liv, if I recall, was the ringleader of all this. She's the worst. They're, they're all awful. But she takes it to a whole new level here. Her attorney must have told her that not seeing the kids won't sit well with the judge, so Liv began to insist on seeing her kids. When it was convenient for her, uh, she, she wanted them for Christmas dinner. James could come too, one big happy family together. Instead, James uh, took, took them to his parents for Christmas. Liv uh, wasn't invited. Liv spent a couple of hours with her kids the Saturday before Christmas, and, and again the Saturday before New Year's Eve. What a great mom. Yeah, uh, definitely uh, mom of the year. That's what they're all <laughs> moms of the year. Uh, here's what James told us about his custody hearing. Our attorney told James that there was no need to pay Liv anything to get the kids. There was not enough room in the apartment Liv and Fran were moving into in January for any of the kids. No place to put them, and Liv had no contact with the kids for almost a month. No judge is going to give her custody. Uh, but the custody hearing got very combative. It became clear that James was not going to pay for Liv, pay Liv for the kids because Liv was not going to get custody of either child. Liv decided to tell the judge that James was not the father of the oldest child, their son. Since he's not James's son, she wants custody. This is just getting crazier and crazier. And by the way, if you hear a bunch of noise, that was a garbage truck over there. The judge asked Liv if the biological father was present in the court. He wasn't. Is he part of the son's life? No. Who is he? Where is he? Liv doesn't remember his last name. I'm sure she didn't know even his first name. For spring break, her sophomore year, Liv went to spring break in Panama City. She met a guy who she spent the better part of two weeks with. Liv got pregnant, James thought it was his child, and Liv, Liv and James got married that summer. Yes, the two guys in this story here got married ridiculously young because 
Their girlfriends got pregnant, and here we are today. The judge asked Liv if, asked if Liv had any proof that James was not the father. No, but she was pregnant after her return from spring break. The judge asked whose name is on the birth certificate, James's name. Did Liv tell James he was the father? Yes, she did. Did Liv know James did, did Liv know James was not the father when she told James he was the father? Yes. The judge asked Liv if she is admit, admitting to paternity fraud. <laughs> Liv's attorney popped up and said there's nothing illegal about a mother convincing a man he's he's the father even when the mother knows he's not the father. And how effed up this world is. James told us he expected our attorney to correct Liv's attorney about this. But it turns out that lying about paternity is not a crime in the U.S. Liv did not commit a crime by telling James he's not the father of the boy, even though Liv knew he's not. Nothing illegal about that in the U.S. of A. Freaking disgrace. At the end of the day, we because it's just like, hey, the guys, you're just supposed to suck it up and pay, even though it was their wives that were sucking it up as some other dude. Regardless, Liv's attorney continued. Liv is making no, no such admission. She's just saying she's unsure of paternity. Liv believes, looking back, that her son <clears throat> may have been fathered by someone other than James. Liv asking for custody using the paternity issue is resolved. The judge ordered a uh, DNA test for both James's kids. The judge also awarded James full custody of both children and visitation rights for Liv. James for Liv. James and Liv would work out times together, but James has control of his kids. James has not heard from Liv since the hearing. He says, I am not so fortunate with Fran. She calls and I have to talk to her. I try to keep our conversation about, about, about the kids, but Fran still pushes her reconciliation. God almighty, these gals are relentless. She wants her personal ATM machine back. But I still have questions about the whys, so I ask. Maybe I'll get some semblance of the truth. Anything is possible. You're never going to get the truth. None of you are ever... You're going to get shades of the truth. You know, trickle down, that type of thing. I was curious why Fran didn't go on spring break with Liv or our sophomore year. They were roommates at the time. Fran said that she planned to go with Liv and the other girls on spring break. Fran had an explanation ready to tell me why she wasn't coming home during the break. But Fran's parents told her they wanted her home. Her parents were having uh, marital problems. There's a surprise. Fran's father had just discovered her mother's long-term affair, and they wanted Fran home as a buffer or mediator or referee. I told Fran that Liv told uh, the court the father of the son was the guy they met on spring break. Fran left and said, a guy? Liv told James some story about having a visit, having to visit her grandparents over spring break. Instead, Liv went to Panama City with some girls from the dorm. Liv ditched the girls almost as soon as they hit the beach. She stayed with three guys from Duke. She slept with all three guys and who knows how many others. <sighs> Sam Gamora 2.0. It was a constant party. Liv has no idea who the father is. Liv went to spring break three months after Liv and James agreed to be exclusive and came home pregnant. How could Liv let herself get pregnant? Both Liv and Fran were on the pill all the time. Liv forgot to pack her pills. Most of the time in Florida, Liv was too drunk to notice if the guys wore condoms. Can anybody say piece of garbage? I read an article about a month ago that listed, I think, Miami as the number one cheating city in the country. Doesn't surprise me at all. And the spring break, the chaotic spring break for Miami is going to begin next month or so. They've been, that turns into a big freaking mess. Did Fran know that Liv uh, says their son is not James's kid? Fran said she knew that Liv came from Florida pregnant and that Liv told James that it was his. Why would Liv announce this at a custody hearing? Fran said Liv told her that she got pissed when it was clear James wasn't going to give her any money to get custody. Liv was also desperate. Liv knows the son is not James. She hoped the judge would award the son to her. She knew James would still want the boy. If the judge gave custody of the boy, James would be forced to pay her to get the son back. She is a piece of garbage. Once Liv and James settled on payment, Liv would realize that, that both kids would be better off with James. It didn't work. She didn't get custody. Maybe after they saw the court order DNA test, Fran said it's possible that the younger child, their 10-year-old daughter, is also not James. Maybe, maybe not. And obviously these kids sooner or later are going to find this out. These poor kids. I mean, oh my God. 
It continues, uh, Fran still denies everything but her affair with Bob's big boy. She even denies talking to, t- talking, taking the detective to a hotel room and snapping his picture, even though she basically admitted to this to me. The wives agree not to talk about their past with their husbands. Why is she telling me all this about Liv? Fran and Liv know, know it's over with James. When Liv told James that he'd be responsible for the kids losing her, their mother, James told her he'll bring the kids to her funeral. That was cold. After that, Liv knew that there was no saving her marriage. Of course there's no saving this effed up marriage. There's nothing Fran is going to tell me about Liv that's worse than Liv telling everyone the son is not James's child. For Liv now, it's all about the money. Well, we can make we can certainly dip, go back and forth about the whole it's all about the money anyway across the board. You all know what I'm talking about here. Uh, James had DNA tests for his kids, and he knows his daughter is his. We have not told the wise about these tests. James didn't mention the tests at his custody hearing. No one asked if he did DNA tests, so he didn't feel he had to say anything. My custody hearing is in two weeks. I have the kids now, and I'm hoping for full custody. I had DNA tests for both the kids, and I know they're mine. I wonder what Fran is going to announce at our custody hearing. It's all about the money for Fran, too. Well, thank God that both your kids are yours, and for you as well as them. And the sooner this thing is put behind you, and you can get their effed up, wacko, evil mother out of the picture, the better. But I feel bad for the kids because, you know, they're suffering too. I mentioned that Jesse continues to live with Hector and is hoping to wear Steve down over time. She calls Steve and Steve listens. Steve is an idiot to listen to her unless he's getting information for you guys. Jesse knows that Steve has the picture in the bathroom of Jesse smiling in a men's room with, with a guy's packed sausage in her mouth. Jesse also knows there's no hope Steve will take her back unless he can get past this, that picture. Jesse asks Steve if she could explain about that night. Sure, here's what Steve told us about Jesse's explanation. Oh, I can't wait to hear her explanation and rationalization for a picture of her with a guy's you-know-what in her mouth in the bathroom. Let's all get ready for this. Apparently, they were in a club with two guys. One of them was Mr. BJ. The men were pushing drinks on Jesse and Debbie, uh, the woman who was with them. They were comparing risky or unusual places they each had SCX. Has either of the gals had SCX in a public men's room? No. The other guy, whom Debbie had paired off with, grabbed Debbie and led her into the men's room. They had SCX in the bathroom stall. Mr. BJ went with them to take pictures. When they returned, Mr. BJ grabbed Jesse and took her to the men's room. Um, I'm having a very hard time believing this is all done against their will. Given that we're in a bar where they have bouncers there and everything else, and any guy in a heartbeat would jump to the rescue of any, any damn soul in distress. So, bullshit. The other guy went in with them to take pictures. Debbie went to watch. Jesse told Steve that she doesn't remember any of this. She learned what happened later from Debbie. Yeah, Debbie is the new gal. We're, we're going to get into momentarily. Debbie told Jesse the bathroom stalls were so gross that Jesse refused to go into them. The guy said okay, but instead of banging Mr. BJ in a stall, Jesse had to give them both BJs. She did, and they took pictures. Jesse said she was blackout drunk. They took advantage of her. She would never do anything like that sober. Yeah, sure. In fact, I'm sure she's done far worse sober. Um, who? She said she was blackout drunk, right? Who made the choice to consume alcohol to get blackout drunk? If that's the truth, her. When she says that the guys were pushing drinks on her, were they literally forcibly making her drink shots and beer and, and whatever? No. She chose to do that, if that's the story here. There's nothing that happened that she didn't choose to, that led from her where she made choices. Again, you got bars and clubs, and they got bouncers, and many men there would be more than happy to come to a rescue if something's going on. I don't want to hear this bull crap. Uh, why didn't Fran or Liv stop her? What kind of friends are they? Jesse said neither Liv or Fran were there. Both were out on dates. It was just her and Debbie, and Debbie was too drunk to stop anything. Yeah, blame the girl that is new to the story here. Oh, by the way, yes, uh, the gal's in accountability. Later that night, things got worse. Oh, do tell. They took Jesse and Debbie back to the men's bathroom. The guys decided it might be entertaining to take off Debbie's clothes. She wasn't wearing much, a dress, shoes, and, and drawers. Debbie told, Debbie told Jesse she wanted, she put up some fake resistance to being stripped, but it was a turn-on. They were all laughing, and Debbie was posing for pictures of the guys who came into the bathroom. Everyone wanted a picture with her. 
It was exciting and fun until Debbie realized they were going to give, not going to give the clothes back. They left her naked in the men's room. Debbie had to hide in the stall. <laughs> Whether that's true or not, that's pretty funny. Debbie told Jesse that Jesse was drinking straight from a bottle by then. She was so drunk she passed out in the men's bathroom. I'm picturing her rolled around the floor butt naked, and there's you all know what it's like in a dirty men's bathroom in some bar. Oh my god. Well, that's where she belongs. If Jesse had not passed out, then probably they would have taken her clothes too. They left Jesse on the men's room floor. She's where she belongs. The bar management was finally told there was a naked gal and unconscious gal in the men's room. They made the guys give back the, the clothes. The four of them were kicked out of the bar. Again, so many elements to this story that's like, okay, at this point now, whether this is true, stranger than fiction story, or some very creative ex writing exercise. I'm doing this now because it's that entertaining and you guys, a big chunk of you guys enjoy watching this, but but God almighty. Okay. So Steve asked, Jesse saying it was not her fault. Of course it's not her fault. It's everybody else's fault when you do these things. Jesse replied she was so drunk she didn't know what was happening. Steve asked, whose fault was it, Jesse? A married woman was in a bar drinking with two guys, neither of whom was her husband. Who was it who kept pouring the booze down her throat until she passed out? Whose fault was it that Jesse lived, lied to Steve and she'd done it for years? What about all the other nights, all the other guys, whose fault was that? Jesse had nothing to say. Of course she had nothing to say because he had her. It's her fault, period. Then Steve asked Jesse, so who's Debbie? You're all wondering who's Debbie. None of the husbands had heard about Debbie. Jesse said Debbie is someone Liv knows who occasionally joins them on girls' nights, but Debbie, Debbie was never a Friday night regular. So we got a part-time HOE bag joining the group here. Steve asked why Debbie never came up when Jesse and Liv told the husbands about the girls' nights. Jesse answered there was no reason for Debbie to come up. She was not really part of the group. The wives would see Debbie every once in a while, once, once a month maybe. Only the three wives were together every Friday, until this pa past year when most Fridays became date nights and they went their separate ways. But they would still occasionally meet up and go to bars to find new guys. Debbie would sometimes join any of the three wives who wanted to go bar hopping. Were there any other wives that joined on girls' nights? No. There were women who had, who they had drinks with, but never, but Jesse never saw them again. Debbie was someone they knew through Liv, who sometimes met up with the three of the wives. I'm kind of surprised that they let another gal come in to be in the competition. That's, that's the part that has me curious. Jesse was at work and told Steve that she had to get out the phone to help some customers. That's all Steve got from, from Debbie about Debbie from Jesse. Steve told us at the gym last Saturday, New Year's weekend, does any of the husband know this Debbie character? James, James said Liv's sister's name is Debbie. Debbie is a few years younger than Liv, and she married Sid. He thinks both are 30 or 31 years old. They have three young kids. Of course, they have young kids. Both Steve and I have met Sid and Debbie a few times at parties at James's house. Neither Steve nor I knew much about them. I asked James what Sid is like. James said he and Sid were not very close. The sisters were close, so the brother the brothers-in-law had to spend time together. They would talk about sports and the weather. One time they talked about politics, but that was a disaster. So by unspoken agreement, they never talked about politics again. Religion, politics, and how much money you have or make, usually best to be quiet about that unless you know for sure you're on the same page as somebody else. Otherwise, it's going to be drama, drama, drama. Unless you want drama, drama, drama. Mostly they sat around drinking beer and listening to their wives. Sid was a nice guy who doted on his wife. Another one-sided marriage with the wife fully in control of an adoring and servile husband, like Steve, James, and I were. And that, guys, is where I'm going to wrap things up in the part one here because this is an even longer update, so I'm splitting this up into three. So I will continue on in, in one hour, maybe two, two hours, for part, Jesus, part eight of this. Now we're going to learn all about Sid and Debbie and the things going on there. And then an hour after that will be part nine. So you guys can get three stories today. So I hope you have some free time here on this crazy effing story here <laughs> that is... The effed up gift that keeps on giving. So guys, stay tuned. A couple hours, you're going to continue on with part eight to see where things are going. See you then.